Welcome to Freya's Fairy Tales, where we believe fairy tales are both stories we enjoyed as children and something that we can achieve ourselves. Each week, we will talk to authors about their favorite fairy tales when they were kids, and their adventure to holding their very own fairy tale in their hands. At the end of each episode, we will finish off with a fairy tale or short story read as close to the original author's version as possible. I am your host, Freya Victoria. I'm an audiobook narrator that loves reading fairy tales, novels, and bringing stories to life through narration. I'm also fascinated by talking to authors and learning about their why and how for creating their stories. We have included all of the links for today's author and our show in the show notes. Be sure to check out our website and sign up for our newsletter for the latest on the podcast. Today is part one of two, where we are talking to Laura John about her novels. Over the next two weeks, you will hear about starting your writing career as an adult, writing to help your mental health, letting your characters do the talking, getting your books in audio, navigating your career after chaos, finding the software that works best for you, the importance of building a community and revealing details in your story when it's necessary for the story. Summer Dreams Age is just a number, or is it? Jax. Growing up, I had it all. I never had to want for anything. Everything was great, and I had a family who cared. But getting tangled up with the wrong crowd ruined that. For years, I lived in addiction, battling the constant need for my next hit and doing shady things. Someone saw more than that wasted addict and helped me get my life back together. With dedication and sheer hard work, I'm finally in a good place. At 40, I own a bar. My bar and my employees are what keep me focused. I let nothing come between me and what I treasure. Until a small man with light and sass threatens everything I believe. When Kev comes into the picture, though, I realize sometimes addiction and obsession are one and the same— He works his way into the very fiber of my being, burrows in my soul. I'm starting to feel things I thought I had buried years ago coming back to the surface. I want him, but he's 21 years younger than me, and everything I'm not. Kevin. My plans are set. The moment I turn 18, I'm off to see anything outside this small NC town— I'd escape the sleepy closed minds and search for acceptance and love elsewhere. Funny thing about declaring plans. Sometimes the universe has other ideas. Despite myself, I find love, support, and even a family amid the small town community. Finding my forever family, I realized I can't leave. They're helping me grow and be the person I want to be. Growing my wings, I find Jax. Grumpy? No-nonsense Silver Fox bar owner. He is my opposite. Cold, brooding, and distant. But something about him draws me in. Unfortunately, he wants nothing to do with me because of my age. Or maybe because our courtship started with a lie. Once he finally lets his guard down and pulls his head out of his ass, we start to explore our relationship. Just as everything starts leading in the direction we both want... Our fresh romance is turned on its head. Can I keep Jax beside me? Or are we bound to break apart? So the podcast is Freya's Fairy Tales, and that is fairy tales in two ways. Fairy tales are something that we watched or listened to or read as kids, and it's also the journey for you to spend weeks, months, years working on your novel to hold that in your hands finally is a fairy tale for you as well. So I like to start off with what was your favorite fairy tale when you were a kid and did your favorite change as you got older? Um, a little bit. I mean, I loved um, Little Red Riding Hood. Okay. And um, I feel like it has somewhat stayed the same, just took in a filthier turn. Um, <laughs> okay. But yeah. <laughs> so. At what age did you kind of like start thinking about writing, start 
I think usually I hear like short stories and stuff like that is what people usually start with. But at what age did you kind of start writing? So for me, I'm kind of like an anomaly. Um, I didn't start writing until um, maybe a year before I published. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah. And I started as like, kind of like an emotional outlet just to kind of help with my mental health. And Uh um, I had been reading a lot and all of these ideas started popping into my head, but I had no plans on publishing whatsoever. It was just for myself. And I was just writing to kind of get these stories that were popping up in my head. Um, But I had no plans on releasing them until a group of other aspiring like writers and authors um I somehow ended up in the group with them and um I <laughs> so don't... You had, somewhere in your head you had thoughts of publishing or that wouldn't happen <laughs> I mean yeah something happened one day I ended up in this like Facebook chat and I was like how did I get here but hi and uh, <laughs> then someone was like oh you know there was telling their journeys and I was like can I give you these like five chapters that I've written Uh and you tell me if it's good if it's good I'll finish it and publish it if it's crap I'll just continue to do what I'm doing I seriously just did the same thing (laughs) with with (laughs) the book I'm working on yeah (laughs) not in a Facebook group I stumbled across I uh, (laughs) roped two authors I narrated for into reading it I was like hey since I spent all this time on your series can you read this real quick (laughs) yeah so you sent it to them and what was their feedback they they were like you need to finish this book because I need to know what happens and they're like it's not crap it's really good and that's how Secret Smiles saw the light of day so you finish you have five chapters done you get feedback to absolutely continue which for me same feedback I got so (laughs) thankfully (laughs) right so you finish writing your book how long did it take you for those first five chapters and then to finish the rest of it so I'm a pretty fast writer especially if like the characters are talking to me Uh um so I think it took maybe three months Okay, yeah, that's pretty it. fast. Pretty fast. And yeah. So you... Go ahead. Sorry, go... <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I was writing. That was about the speed I was writing uh, at that time. Now I'm even a little bit faster, but. Now that you kind of figured out how to develop the story in your head. <laughs> yeah, unless, like I said, unless the characters aren't talking. Like I just recently had one book that I ended up putting to the side and it's probably never going to see the light of day because the characters just stopped talking. Mm -hmm. So um, I was working on that one for three months and maybe was halfway through. Uh. And then as soon as I put, put it to the side and started on my next book, I think I got the next book done the majority of it in a month. Oh gosh. So it's like, it depends on the characters. (laughs) Yeah. I think I found that I started one got, 30,000 words into it and then another book started writing itself around Christmas and I'm like I think I was just writing the wrong genre (laughs) and that's the thing I think sometimes either it's the characters or it's the genre or the subgenre or whatever it Mm -hmm. is and it's just not flowing and I think for me especially the more I force myself to write something the harder it becomes Mm -hmm. and then and then it just takes longer and sometimes like I mean that book just isn't going to get finished right or you're going to spend so long on it you could have finished five other books in the time you've been slogging through exactly so where do the ideas for your books come from I know you said it started as like a mental health kind of thing where did where did the stories come from what inspired them so like the first story came to me in a dream like a lot of authors say (laughs) um and it really did like I had this dream about this rock star and I was like "Ooh, I need to write this story (laughs) and um for a lot of my other books I think that the stories come from like a bunch of different places sometimes it'll come from a meme. Sometimes it'll come from somebody being like, Hey, I'm looking for this kind of book. And I'm like, I could want to write that kind of book. I'm like, and then, and then it starts snowballing and 
the characters eventually pop up in my head and like, hey, that's my story. (laughs) (laughs) So you type the end on book number one. And then what did you do after that point? Did you immediately publish? Did you take it to an editor? What did you do after that? Yeah, so I did the like whole like, you know, hired an editor. Um, While I was writing, I had people reading it. So my alpha readers, I had some beta Mm -hmm. readers uh, after it was finished, before it went to the editor. Um, and then, yeah, I got edited, proofed. Um, I hired a cover designer. I did all of the stuff, um, because I wanted to put out the strongest book possible. Um, and for me, I think like the one thing I would never skimp on is editing. Like Uh I would always make sure I hired an editor and paid for an editor because you can, like, I would never put out like a crappy cover, but I would put out like a plain cover. Like I would put out just like a black cover with the title Uh over like something that was like cheaply made, but people would buy that if it had great reviews, like, I mean, I've like seen some beautiful covers made on Canva where the author did it themselves. And I'm like, that fits the genre perfectly. Exactly. And you didn't and pay some, anything. Exactly. And some people are really great at that. I'm not. I'm okay with Canva. <laughs> um, but like, if I say I didn't have like the money at all, right? Mm-hmm. I would just put out like a really plain cover mm-hmm. because I feel like people would still pick that up over something that had a ton of reviews being like, this God, book is poorly this edited. Editing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or even if people weren't writing that in reviews, they wouldn't be putting positive reviews out either. Right. Um, Cause I know like from like my personal standpoint, I don't put out negative reviews, but I would like say to a friend, Oh, this book was like a little hard to read because of yeah. this. Just, Just to so let you know. Going into this, it might be difficult to get through. Mm. <laughs> I get that. I've I've had a couple of um narrating ones that I had to essentially reject for that reason. It's like I I don't I don't know what's happening. I yeah. it takes like 10 times longer to narrate it when the sentences are all like weird. <laughs> like, right. <no. laughs> so to me editing is like that one thing that to like a newbie author I would like say don't mm-hmm. ever skimp on. And the thing is you can actually find some really good editors for not a bad price but if they are cheaper you have to put in more work to find the good ones Mm -hmm. because I would say the ones that are priced lower there are some really amazing ones but you need to make sure you're doing the like um getting them a sample edit and all of that and really searching through because I would say the lower the price, the harder it is to find the really good ones. <laughs> I have to say it's the same for so so far my books are still in the production in production writing stages, but for narrators it's the same. There's a lot of narrators that do royalty share, but finding a narrator that does royalty share that doesn't sound like they're reading down a hallway or there's a bunch of like crackling and popping going on with their audio because they didn't edit it or like Right. They they sound super monotone and boring and no one's going to want to listen to that book. Like it's really right. hard for narrators too to find or for authors to find narrators that are like within their price. I, I work with a lot of indie, like brand new getting started authors. So yes, not big budgets to pay all the money up front. So. No, I get that. I have one audio book out and I'm yeah, told I saw ev- Marcus and Macy did it. Yes, and it's amazing. And I <laughs> yeah. love it so much, but I have told everyone um, to wait at least a couple of years for any more <laughs> audio books for me. I'm like, well, here's one. Happy birthday. Yeah. Um, it'll be a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I have authors that I've, I'm like narrating series for and I'm like their books are so well done I'm like can I just be like can you just exclusively sign with me as your narrator because like I want to do everything you put out <laughs> right I mean if if it wasn't like a series of interconnected standalones mm-hmm. I would have hired Marcus and Macy for all of them yeah but obviously each like book has different couples so it does need different narrators yeah I've done um I've seen, I did research because I was, um, I got hired on to do this series that's like, it's a bunch of brothers, like siblings Mm -hmm. together. And so I was like, how does one do, um, I'm like, are there, are there series like that where like the same narrators have done it? And so I like kind of did my research on it and there's actually a couple that does narrate 
And they just, you know, do the characters for the rest of the series and just keep on going. And I was like, okay, it can be done with just one narrator. Yeah, I think it absolutely can be. I'm just like one of those people that I'm like yeah. in my you want head. Them all unique. I have- <laughs> Yeah, well, and I just have, like, such different voices in Uh my head for the characters. So it's like, oh, I want different ones. (laughs) (laughs) So you had it edited. You had your cover professionally done. That was all for book one. What did you do to, when did you release book one, the first one? Oh, September, I believe, of many, many years ago. Uh, No, not quite that long, but um, (laughs) twenty twenty. 2019, I think. Okay, so before COVID. Yes, it was before okay. COVID. <laughs> okay. So you have quite a few books that you've put out since then. So you got that first one done. What did you do to kind of promote that first book? Oh, so back then, uh, Facebook parties were really hopping. Um, mm-hmm. And you could do a lot. I mean, I think they're still happening. I just don't think they're as worth the effort as much anymore. I mm-hmm. still like to participate in them. Um, and cause I love interacting with people. So that's like my happy spot, but, um, it's just like back then, like that was just a great free marketing tool. And mm-hmm. now I wouldn't say it's as the good trends of have changed. Tool. Yes. Yeah. Um, and people, yeah, they're just like not interacting as much and stuff and you know people are elsewhere also so they're not as often in Facebook they're on different social media platforms and stuff so um so when I first started that was really a great way to market and it was free and um, free is good (laughs) yeah and yeah secret smiles really like took off to begin with and then um even before uh like Secret Smiles was released like as soon as it was done I pretty much started on book two so um I had most of book two written even before book one was released so okay. that kind of also helped with like momentum was you had this um, other book that came out shortly after yeah so yeah. since I started I've been releasing faithfully every three months since I started okay um and then moving into this year I'm crazy and um (laughs) I'm gonna be releasing every two months this year so starting I just had a release two days ago and oh gosh so so March uh, so by the time this airs I'm gonna have to be like what book just released (laughs) yeah because yeah because we'll have a new release in May and then July September uh (laughs) November, December, and January. Yeah, I have three months in a row because I'm doing a Christmas novella. My personal <laughs> assistant uh, has been, she's like, I can't believe you're doing this. I'm like, shh, it's fine. <laughs> That's what I tell a lot of my authors when they're like, why are you doing so many audiobooks? Like, you need to relax. And I'm like, but my brain likes the chaos. And then, like, it calms it when I have to focus on, like, one task at a time. Well, As opposed I, to like sitting on the couch just reading, which is what I did prior. Not that like reading is, you know, right. slacking off or anything, but it's like your brain can wander a lot more. And that's me too. Like I give myself fake deadlines because also, yeah, I'm, I'm indie. <laughs> well, like they're early because if I don't have a deadline, my... ADHD is just like we can do whatever we want procrastination um (laughs) but if I give like myself like a fake deadline I'm like I have to have this book done then my ADHD is just like we have to get the book done it's done due by this date it doesn't matter that the date isn't real my ADHD still is like (laughs) we said this was the date we told ourselves we're gonna get this done so it pushes think, me into getting it done. I think that's how my narrator schedule works, too, where I just have, like, books back to back to back to back. And if I finish one early, do I take the day off that I could take? No, I just start the next one and just keep going. And then well, I move them all up my calendar to, like, fake myself into thinking you have to get these all done now. Yes. <laughs> and I see authors, they're like, oh, I just finished a book, so I'm going to take, like, a couple weeks off. I'm like, weeks? I might take a day off. <laughs> yeah, I've talked to a few that take the couple weeks off from that book 
to like kind of so their brain is fresh into it when they jump back in after a couple weeks. Yeah, um, I do that. Not necessarily too. like I'm not going to write at all for two weeks. It's more like <laughs> this book needs a break for two weeks. <laughs> I do do that. Um, like usually what I do is when I finish a book, I start on the next book that I want to write. Mm-hmm. And then um, I work at that one. Depending on like where my deadline, my actual deadlines are. So when it's due with the editor and stuff, mm-hmm. um, uh, I, I let the like last book, like breathe for a bit, just sit. And then, um, I come back to it a couple weeks before it's due with the editor go through for my final, like self edit. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then either finish the other book. I like, I like to finish the one book I was working on before I go back, sometimes it doesn't work that way and I have to go in uh, (laughs) between. So either go back to the book I was working on, do like a self-edit or finish it or whatever. And then I kind of like work back and forth a little bit while it's in editing processes and stuff. Okay. So you are rapid releasing is what I would consider what you do <laughs> all these yeah. books and have you been have you kept it up or did you have a break because if you started in 2019 I didn't actually count how many books you have on Amazon how many have you released so far <sighs> um <laughs> so eight I think um I just released book 16 okay that's a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you had these books. You how did the audiobook come about? Um a little bit of like a bunch of things. Um a crazy thing happened. Um I've always kind of wanted to get my book into audiobook. Um mm-hmm. I think it was a little bit of FOMO as well though. Um which is uh, why I chose Secret Smiles when in retrospect I should have chose a different book that had like maybe only one or two in a series and not eight because <laughs> they are so expensive um yeah. <laughs> but but you know I'm still really happy that I did it um but I was looking for a narrator and um I had found one um And then this crazy thing happened on TikTok. I thought was a really good thing. It turned out to be a gong show. Um, (laughs) And then, um, and then I ended up finding Marcus. And um, (laughs) so in the long run, it ended up working out really well. And I learned a lot about audiobooks and about the whole process because there was a lot of false information Mm -hmm. in the author world. Like we Mm -hmm. were told these ridiculous numbers. And so when I had found my first narrator that I ended up not using, um, I was like, oh, this is a great deal. And then I was like, once I found out the real information, I'm like, oh, it wasn't. And then I ended up losing money. So it really wasn't a great deal. Um, (laughs) But yeah, like you live and you learn. And um, I was really happy to like find out the real information and then to meet some awesome narrators in the process Mm -hmm. like I met Marcus um I became like really close friends with Corvin King Mm -hmm. um who I want to narrate one of my books and I have a very specific book but it's in the middle of the series so like we're (laughs) waiting you gotta do the other ones first (laughs) because Corvin keeps like when are you gonna hire me I'm like soon ish not really but eventually (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so my husband is writing a book and very very good writing. He's way further ahead than I am. Um but he he's disle- it's so weird. He's dyslexic so he writes super slow because he's being very careful to make sure that he's using the right words and like editing yeah. it as he goes and like that is what his dyslexic brain needs to make sure that he's putting out the best book. So I'm like you do right. you. But He's like, um, had never heard me narrate before. I'd been narrating for about a year. He had never <laughs> heard me narrate before. And I have this one book I do for this author who his publisher hired me. And he's very type A. And he was like, I don't know if I can listen to the audiobook before you send it to the publisher. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like, husband, 
I need you to listen to this book because there's like a, it was a fantasy sci-fi. There was a ton, there was over 300 made up words in this book. I'm like, I need to make sure that those words sound natural in the speech. I need to make sure that I don't sound insane. Like this was the (laughs) biggest project. It was a, it was three books that I did in a row. And I'm like, I need someone to make sure besides just me that like, I am not crazy thinking that I'm doing this good. (laughs) And so he listens and he's like, you can narrate my book now. Unfortunately, there's like 10 accents in the book that I don't know how to do. And I'm like, I can't do the book. But Corvin is the, his is a dual POV or it like, it switches between male and female POV. Yeah. Um, it's not just two though. Um, but I'm like, you need one male and one female narrator. But I know Corvin learns accents really easily. So I'm like, you should use him. He's and then so Paige, good at accents. I'm like lobbying for like Paige Reisenfeld to be the other the female one because I'm like I love her voice too (laughs) I love Paige um and I have I haven't even I talk with Paige and I haven't even told her this but I want her to do Hidden Kisses which is book two in the love and scene but I just know I have no money right now so I'm not even like telling (laughs) you're like yeah just yeah well and uh so I was on a live, I was on their books and audio a couple weeks ago and Paige is like, I mentioned something about my husband writing a book and she's like, oh, are you going to narrate it? And I'm like, actually, I want you to narrate it. <laughs> but I don't know, it may be a situation where like I end up having to narrate it until we can save the money for someone else to do it kind of situation. Because right. with his dyslexia, like audiobooks is how he consumes books. So it feels very weird to not have one at all. So I have no idea what he's thinking. Um, right. He does accents very well. So I'm like, maybe I can do because all the males are the ones with accents. So I'm like, maybe I can do the female parts and you can do the male parts. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? He's still probably six to eight months from being finished. So we'll see. <laughs> you got lots of time. I'm like, There's tons of time. There's tons of time. <laughs> so you stumbled along a not right narrator and then you found the right narrators for the job. And how was that? Um, what was kind of the misinformation that you were given beyond like it? I mean, I've heard crazy numbers for like, oh, it's going to cost you $10,000 to make your audio book. That was what I heard all the time was $10,000. Yeah. Like, and I was like, there is no way that this is happening. I, I don't have $10,000. Yeah. And, um, and if so you put it think- up for royalty share audition, you're probably going to get a bunch of like, I've heard everything from they auditioned with a different book to they just recorded some random song to like <laughs> <laughs> they used AI to do the audition. I'm like, who knows what you're going to get if you put it up for royalty share? <laughs> yeah. And I was pretty adamant that I didn't really want to necessarily do royalty share. Mm-hmm. Um and I didn't really want to do it like through, especially like royalty share through ACX. Cause I was like, mm-hmm. I don't want to be in there. Like, like when you're stuck with them for yeah. like, or like ACX exclusive or whatever, I didn't yeah. want to do that. Right. So I was like, okay, I need to have, um, like the file, like all mine so that mm-hmm. I can like upload it and then put it on like whatever platforms I want to put it on. Right. Um, and so I was like, okay, then I have to pay for it outright. And I'm like, mm-hmm. do I have $10,000? No, I guess I'm never having an audiobook, <laughs> which is where I fell into like the crazy um, rabbit hole of the insanity that happened on TikTok. Um, because when you're told it's going to cost $10,000 and someone comes and is like, we'll pay you to have your book. You're like, Wait. oh no, you were part of the app. I was. Okay. (laughs) I had no idea. I was, well, see, here's the thing. That is nothing against you. They made it look like a beautiful dream. They They really did. did. They did. And I was one, like, I was not a part of, like, management. I I had no say in anything, but... I mean, they had a very charismatic group of front runners on that. I, I will give them that. Yes. They and didn't know how to answer a question, but very no. charismatic. <laughs> yes. And, um, but then when like crap hit the fan, yeah, they disappeared mm-hmm. and Corbin and I were left to deal with the damage. But because Corbin and I did it so well and we're such like amazing human beings, um, 
we actually garnered a lot of like love and that's how we met like mm-hmm. a lot of people and connected with stuff. But like, I kept saying to my husband, I was just like, I'm not sure if my career is over because I made a mistake, like, because mm-hmm. I fell into this like thing, but because Corvin and I were like answering to the best of our knowledge right. and giving everyone like the best that we could. And we weren't involved in management in any way, shape or form. We were just like the lowly people at the bottom who got like roped into these charismatic people. Right. <laughs> and I have to say any, not, not just this thing, any yeah. drama on book talk that goes down at all. I have so much more respect for the ones that are like, I'm sorry, I screwed up. Here's yeah. what I'm going to do to fix it. As opposed to that. I didn't do anything wrong. I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea well, what you're talking about. That never happened. I don't know. What and people are like, we have screenshots. Like, what are you talking and about? I even like <laughs> came forward and like, I even made like an apology video. And, but the thing was like, I really didn't have much to apologize for, but I was just like upset, like that, you know, that it had happened. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to be like, I'm sorry for like my part in it. Not that I had much of a part in it, but mm-hmm. I mean, Corbin and I were very publicly known to kind of have been connected. So we had to say something, we had to do something so that people mm-hmm. didn't think we were in cahoots because we weren't. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think like the the board, at least that I know, was like Chance and Willow and then Thor were like the only three that I knew. And then like so, the one jokey guy. So Willow I, and I Thor I were actually him, so. not even on the board. The board was <laughs> Chance. That's the thing. Like, but here everyone thought like. Because um, that's how they like, presented it. Well, yeah. But here when I was presented it, I was Willow's name was never mentioned to me when I was presented it. I didn't know about Willow till the day of the live. And oh, I was gosh. like, wait, what's happening? And then I was like, cause I already knew not to be connected with her. Um, so I was like, what is happening? And then, um, so I didn't know about it till like pretty much the day of the live. And, um, or like, <laughs> I think slightly before that she had made a video and I was like, what? And then- To be quite they- honest, I can't keep track of like who's on, I I know she's on the bad list because she like so many she was getting so many people banned at that time that like I yeah. knew so like she's blocked on all my accounts so that I don't have that problem. Yes. All, I should say all hundred of her accounts are blocked on my account so that doesn't happen. But like you could be one of the most controversial authors and I would have no idea because I can't ever remember her name. Me, that's me too. But I'm like, can um, someone give me a list, please? <laughs> right? Yeah, we need a list. Um, but yeah, so um, of beta readers too. I need a list of like ARC and beta readers to never use too. Like this one, pirates yeah. stuff, don't use them. I need that list too. Yeah, there, there's definitely a list. <laughs> so but you yeah, guys so got stuck cleaning up. <laughs> we got stuck cleaning up, and then, um, but it ended up for Corbin and I being a positive. Um, but I remember literally like there was one live that Corbin and I were on right after it had happened. I want to say maybe it was the day after. Um, so before the death threats. Yes. Um, no, it was after the the death threat. I'm I'm going to put that in quotation marks because, um, there was a lot figured oh, yeah. out about that as well. I, I don't. But, I, um, I, I never believed it. I was like, that's awful convenient for you. Right? <laughs> oh, so I can't remember if it was before or after the death threats, but it was after everything collapsed. Um, Corvin and I were on a live together and we were both literally just crying because we didn't know what we were going to do. We didn't mm-hmm. know what was going to happen. Well, because um, he was supposed to be one of the like narrators involved in it. So we were both told that we were going to be getting large amounts of money Mm -hmm. um money that was literally life-changing for our families Mm -hmm. um and then obviously that wasn't happening anymore (laughs) Mm -hmm. so um so yeah it was like just something that we had to cry over but um you know it connected like us in a way that I don't think others kind of could connect with like Mm -hmm. over because we trauma bonded. Um, (laughs) I mean, there are others involved that could have bonded in more sinister ways. (laughs) Oh, exactly. So yeah. So there was like, it was just a whole gong show. And, um, but 
you know, I always like to look at, you know, the silver lining and the positivity of things. And um, through it all, I met some amazing people. Like, obviously, like, that's how I met um, Marcus. And that's how I met, um, like, a a bunch of authors on TikTok, or, uh, sorry, narrators on TikTok. Like, Mm -hmm. And like Ruthie and um, Paige and mm-hmm. like so many amazing human beings and, um, you know, developed friendships and connections and, mm-hmm. you know, positive things came out of it for us. And, um, you know, it didn't ruin my career. Thank God. Um, and, <laughs> I mean, you're still putting out books, so I I'm still putting not. Out- <laughs> And, but yeah, it was, it was a big learning curve and now I'm, but also I feel like I was kind of looking at the world with rose colored glasses before that happened. Mm -hmm. And that took my rose colored glasses off and, um, slightly did jade me a little, like I'm very cautious about things now and I'm very, which isn't a bad thing necessarily. No, I don't think so. But, like, I'm not just jumping into things anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I do a lot of research about people and (laughs) things. And I don't say just, oh, this is amazing. Yes, anymore. Um, My rose-colored glasses have been thrown away. And um, (laughs) I I can't tell you the number of times. So my general process when I get a contract on an audiobook, because I do a lot through ACX, where, like, you don't know who's actually sending you this offer on this book. You have no idea. So I always, right. which when you work for big publishers, it's a no-no to reach out to the author separately. But on ACX, I got to make sure that I'm actually dealing with someone who's authorized to be making this audiobook. Right. So I, what do you do? You Google the author. Because yes. like <laughs> the author's going to know, does someone have the rights to make the audiobook <laughs> or not? Yes. So I Google the author. I reach out to the author via whatever social media I can. So like yesterday, just yesterday, I emailed an author because I got an offer on her audiobook. And I'm like, hey, you know, super excited to see your book. I'm waiting to hear back on your public on, you know, from whoever sent me this contract on if the timeline can be a few months later. Um, But I just wanted to check in with you and make sure that, like, you even know this is happening. And she's like what's the name on the contract? <laughs> like, So I tell her, she's like, okay, that's that's my publisher. We're good. We're good. <laughs> but this is not the first time I've heard this. I'm the first person who's ever reached out to her about, is this okay that I'm doing this with whoever is sending me this stuff? Like, I've been doing it since I started doing fiction, reaching out to them, one, ACX messaging system sucks. So like half the time you don't get your messages. So I'm like, I'll right. reach out on, you know, Instagram, some other social media where I can message them and be like, hey, or, you know, sometimes we're friends on TikTok or whatever, but those messages always get buried. I can't ever keep track of those. I say if someone's going to message me, Instagram probably, if we're not Mm -hmm. friends, is the easiest way to get through. Because like I check my Instagram quite regularly and it's like right at the top um, if it's mm-hmm. like in the like other folder. So I see it right away if there's something right. in my other folder. Whereas Facebook, you have to like go into another thing to find if something's in your other folder. And I yeah. might forget to do that. And well, also- the issue with Facebook is it's under my legal name and you can't message out from a page until they've messaged you and then you can reply back. So like if they don't have anything but Facebook, I have to send it from my legal name and then explain who I am. <laughs> so oh, it's just yeah. an extra annoyance to have to go through Facebook. <laughs> Right. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't even like think of that. But yeah, Instagram, I'm always like, it's kind of the easiest if people are going to reach out to me, mm-hmm. we've never communicated before. Or email. Or, like, or email. email. Yeah. yeah, my email is usually listed kind of everywhere. Um, Or if you're on my website, you can set. No, don't do that. I pro- I don't check those very often. <laughs> I was like, you can send a message through my website. I don't check. It might take a while. <laughs> well, yeah, in- Instagram. Well, I should say all Instagram. the social medias are set up to send me notifications if I get a message. TikTok is unreliable and it's mm-hmm. telling me. And then emails. I'm I'm like always my phone. I always tell authors that I work with. I'm like. If you message me and I don't respond within a couple of hours, something seriously has happened to me unless it's like the middle of the night and I'm sleeping. But if it's like the middle of the day and I don't message within a couple hours, 
assume I died because like well, my phone is always with me. <laughs> same. I would say either like assume it like if it was your first time messaging me and I haven't responded within a couple hours or like emailing me, um, assume it went to my junk and like mm -hmm. reach out a different way or resend because I am constantly on my phone or on my computer and like yeah if I haven't responded to an email within a couple hours it went to junk or if we've already been talking back and forth that I don't respond in a couple hours again just send another email because I yeah. forgot to respond <laughs> That's, I read it and in my head I responded and then I just didn't while it makes me cringe when someone comments on a post of mine and says, check your DMs, blah, blah, blah. If you've sent me a legitimate DM, not a scammy, I want to pay, I want you to pay me to boost your account. Like, don't yes. don't message me and comment on my post. But if I'm like, OK with it, if you are legitimately trying to get a hold of me and I haven't go comment on a post of mine, because that's Same. another way that I can see <laughs> like, yes. hey, I tried to send you a message and you haven't responded. Like, what's going on? Um, yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Like, um, but that is that is OK as long as you are not trying to spam me with your weird pay to promote your account stuff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but like you were saying with um, the authors, like reaching out to them for narrating and stuff. Mm -hmm. One thing I don't think a lot of authors know, and I'm not sure how... Who told me this? But I've known this for a really long time about claiming your titles on mm -hmm. ACX, even if you're not going yep. to do an audiobook. Just go yep. and claim them because they're your books. And then that way, someone else can't go and claim them because you've already done it and they can't try and do your book without yeah. your permission. <laughs> now, to my understanding, because I've never seen the author side of it yet. Um, but you can go claim your book, but that's not where you choose the exclusive or not exclusive to Amazon part. That's just saying, like, this is my book. Yeah. No one else can make this into audio but me. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's how it works because it's in the contract where you have to then say whether it's exclusive or not and yeah. all that fun business. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, there's a couple things that it, it feels like you're setting up an audio book and you're like, no, I don't want to set up an audio book. Just follow through. Don't worry. Don't put it up for like, cause you can click either putting it up for audition or not. So obviously you're not mm -hmm. putting it up for audition because you right. don't want auditions because you're not doing an audiobook uh, yet. <laughs> right. But you're just claiming your title. So you would just click not up for audition and then you just fill out all the information and then um, just save it. And then, cause you're not going through all the way. And then once you do decide to go through all the way, it's like a slightly different process too. Cause I figured that out when I was putting up secret smiles. Cause I was like, <laughs> now what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> I need to step up. I, I just had a recent, a new thing happen. So I narrated a book a year ago. It was the 10th audiobook I had ever done. And so like, or 10th fiction audiobook I had ever done. I didn't really know what I was doing. Fiction narrating wise. I really, it was like in the spring I did it. And like, late summers kind of when I like hit my stride and finally like actually learned how to read a book <laughs> and so like I'm like hey book two is coming out like here in a month and I'm like okay we're gonna do book two's audiobook but like I'd kind of like to go make book one a lot better so we just had to figure out how to like reopen book one so I could remake book one royalty share it makes sense to make it better because that pays me um mm -hmm. but I'm like and it's part of a series. So I'm like, I imagine at the end, this publisher is going to want a box set with all four audiobooks together. And I'm like, it'll be really weird if book one is like, meh, and then the other ones are good. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, let's make book one good so that it matches the rest. <laughs> yes. Also, some of the character voices. As So yesterday, I started the first day of redoing book one. And some of the character voices, I'm like, why did I use this character voice? This doesn't fit this character at all. And the author said the same thing. She's like, I always pictured this one higher pitched. And I'm like, me too. <laughs> like, like, why did I do this? <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so then I'm literally sending her voice clips on Instagram. If I was going to recast this today, this is what I would do. And she's like, all of them. Yes. <laughs> so I'm like, I nailed it the second time. <laughs> Who knows what well, I was doing I back in those days? I don't I don't know what I was doing a year ago. <laughs> I think we all get stronger in whatever mm -hmm. path like we're doing as we like 
grow and like do more, right? Like Secret Smiles was my first book. Although I would say like after listening back with the um, like audio, so I had, mm-hmm. that was the first time I had reread that book probably since it released because I don't mm-hmm. reread my books. Um, so like I was reading it while listening to the audio, making sure it was all right. And um, I would say like, I still think that book is still pretty strong, especially mm-hmm. for being like a debut novel. Right. So um. Because I've heard other authors are like, oh, I need to go back and like rewrite my beginning stuff or whatever, rework it. I don't know if I would just because, first of all, that book means a lot to me. Um, mm-hmm. I put a lot of myself into the characters and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, more, I think I put a little bit of myself in all of my characters. But that book, I would say Tia is a lot of me. Um mm-hmm. Her her bullying isn't necessarily like the way I was bullied, and um, I didn't have um a sexy rock star sharing secret <laughs> smiles with me. Um, but you so know, some of it was fiction. <laughs> uh, but like, I guess like a lot of her personality though is me, and mm-hmm. so that book is just will always hold a super special place in my heart, and um the fact that I think it still stands up pretty well to me, I just don't feel the need to rework it. But well, that also, mean- so you have to also take into consideration though, like some authors that started like say 10 years ago may not have had beta readers look at it the first time. They may not have had editors look at it the first time. That's and now true. that they've learned, we need to have other eyes on it besides us, because I can't tell you how many books that I've read that it's quite clear. They, wrote it and hit publish like without ever looking back at it and you're just like why um that that is true and so, i have yeah there's a little that. bit of a difference if <laughs> I, I feel yeah. like most of the ones that rewrite it that's how they started because i've talked to several that are like i didn't notice it to an editor at the beginning or i thought it was good enough until the bad reviews started rolling in <laughs> yeah so, like, there, there's that's a little bit true. of a difference there <laughs> well and that's true and um that's not to say I wouldn't ever rework a book but because I've actually done it um Fighting Attraction is my spinoff series of Love and Sienna and Sentinel Protection Duology and um the book that's out now is actually second edition because um I had to go back and rework it um because I had reviews coming in not that the editing was Sienna there was a Sienna book up for audition recently I have those all claimed. There shouldn't be a love in Sienna. Take it out for me, though. Yeah, I'm about, I'm about to search it. <laughs> was it your book? I, I don't know. Let's see. No, it was Vienna calling. <laughs> Not oh, there yours. we go. <laughs> I was like, it's something I, with Iena. <laughs> no, I definitely have all of the Sienna books claimed, so it shouldn't be, but... <laughs> um, I was thinking maybe you accidentally set it up for audition. I was not thinking oh, someone else right. stole it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's actually true. I probably, that that sounds a lot like me <laughs> accidentally doing something. Um, but yeah, so if I think attraction, the reviews were coming in. And unfortunately, like, and I knew right away that that book was rushed. Mm-hmm. Um, I had rushed it because um, life had happened. I had hit a very bad depression. So um, I wasn't writing for a while. Um, Mm -hmm. I was just in a really crappy headspace. And so I rushed the book. um, And we got like it got edited. um, But it wasn't as strong of like a piece and even putting it out, I was like, this isn't my best work. Mm -hmm. And then when the reviews started coming back, and a few people said that like, I had kind of put a little bit of like harmful rhetoric, um, because it is an MM romance. Um, and, uh, I had that book only sensitivity read by like a female and not a gay man. Now Mm -hmm. all of my MM romances are sensitivity read by a really great author friend of mine. Um, so he does all of my sensitivity reading now, but at that time, um, I hadn't done that. Also didn't at that time fully know all about sensitivity reading and that kind Mm -hmm. of stuff. So I thought what I was doing was enough and then it wasn't um Mm -hmm. so went back reworked it 
obviously listened to the people because I'm like, I don't ever want to put something out that would be harmful. I've always said that since day one. Um, Judging also- from the other one, I'm sure you did some kind of an apology. Yeah, I, I mean, hope. I I didn't necessarily do a public apology, um, but I just immediately pulled it and Mm -hmm. put out the like new edition and was like, this is a better version. This is actually like, I've put in the work, this one actually, you know, and since like then I've said it like time and like, I've said it on multiple podcasts and lives and everyone who knows me knows that like, um, yeah, I like put in the work because it's like, yeah, someone says something. I think it shows action sometimes even speaks louder than words. Mm-hmm. So the fact that like, as soon as I saw those reviews, the book was immediately not on Amazon anywhere, right? Like mm-hmm. it was immediately pulled. I wasn't profiting from it. I wasn't doing yeah. anything. Whereas like other authors who have put out problematic material, you know, they're like, oh, I'll change it eventually. I'm sorry um, yeah it's so disingenuous know, <laughs> and and then the thing like that really gets me is like yeah the apology is disingenuous and then the book is still available and it's like yeah did you mean that apology like at all yeah no <laughs> the answer is no no <laughs> yeah no, so they didn't. as far as the rewriting I just did well, I'm in the process of rewriting. I wrote the first two chapters of my book, loved those, started writing the third where I'm like introducing the male main character. And I'm like writing it as like kind of a journal entry kind of thing um, for Ooh. his like introduction into it. And I'm like, it's like a Beauty and the Beast retelling. OK, so like in the original Beauty and the Beast, like the actual original, original Beauty and the Beast, um, She is with the beast, obviously, but then she has these dreams where she's with the human version of the beast. And so, like, it's kind of a back Mm. and forth where she doesn't, the human version keeps saying, you know, looks can be deceiving and, like, things like that. And then she goes back to the beast and she's like, well, I'm falling in love with the guy in my dreams. And then, of course, as we all know, the story goes, she ends up falling in love with the beast. Um, So I'm like, I'm like, we're going to kind of twist it a little bit and we're going to introduce him through these like this like journal entry kind of situation. And so I took the old Beauty and the Beast and I'm just like basically rewriting the actual text. And I'm like, this has no personality in it. Like, (laughs) this is not okay. Thankfully, it's only like maybe a thousand words that I'm having to like rewrite. I wasn't, I'm like on chapter three. I'm not that far into the book, but I'm like, I don't like this at all. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm like, yeah, Yeah. I I get, I totally get the like put in the work part of it. Cause it's like, I, you know, I feel like my first two chapters, very good. In fact, my best friend who read chapter two, I get to the end of it and it's like, and then I opened up the journal and started to read and she's like, what does the journal say? (laughs) I'm like, you'll find out when I finish the third chapter. (laughs) That's like, so I have usually two to three alpha readers that read my books while I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I, um, depending on like how it's kind of going, I will sometimes have like a beta or or to read it after um with the one I'm currently working on because of how I've structured it uh, with my alphas so I've sent like chapters to like one alpha and then once they were done with their notes then I've sent it to the next and once mm-hmm. they were done with their notes then I've sent it to the next yeah so because of how I've structured it this time um, I'm not sending it to betas after I'm just sending it to two sensitivity readers. Um, mm-hmm. cause they're like betas also, right. um, in a sense. So, um, and then it gets like, like I have two different editors like now, cause I have a new editing team. Um, so like I have my developmental editor mm-hmm. who reads it twice and then it goes to a completely separate, like line editor and then it goes to a completely separate proofreader so I have like even (laughs) after I have like three more sets of eyes after so I am confident that it will be okay (laughs) I'm doing it essentially the way you would do it if you were publishing on Kindle Vela write one chapter completely go back through that chapter and then I just bought the pro pro writing aid so I can pop it in there for more like specific stuff and then once it, that's gone through and I've reread it through again, then I send it to them. So it's like as edited as I'm going to be able to get it until I'm totally done and read through everything all together. 
They're getting oh, a no, my elf, clean copy. <laughs> my alphas are getting rough copies. <laughs> well, that's, I had originally done that. I had sent the first chapter as a, is this worth continuing to write? I sent the first mm-hmm. chapter where I had just like basically sped wrote through. It was like maybe 1,200 words. And I sent it to them completely like I hadn't even reviewed it at all. And so like one of the authors that I was working with had pro writing aid and she ran it through there and had like all these changes and stuff. And then I had like, so I, she's like, some of these sentences are really long. I'm like, okay, so I get pro writing aid and I pop it in there. And it's like, you have this sentence is longer than like 40 words. I'm like, <laughs> oh no. And then my paragraphs are just like giant chunks of t- like gigantic, like you should really break that into like four paragraphs. And I'm like, yeah, I, I get why she was like, this is kind of hard to read. I'm like, the words all make sense for the yeah. most part. Like you could tell where I had accidentally swapped out a word, but it was like just the format of the paragraphs and sentences was awful. <laughs> but also, I mean, that is like, where like you pay an editor Mm -hmm. like that like they know that that happens so um my editors also like like I said they're brand new to me um super amazing way more than I'm used to spending um I was (laughs) a little like but I need I needed new people in my life so you know it's good it was just a little bit of a oh it's more than I wanted (laughs) summer dreams Age is just a number, or is it? Jax. Growing up, I had it all. I never had to want for anything. Everything was great, and I had a family who cared. But getting tangled up with the wrong crowd ruined that. For years, I lived in addiction, battling the constant need for my next hit and doing shady things. Someone saw more than that wasted addict and helped me get my life back together. With dedication and sheer hard work, I'm finally in a good place. At 40, I own a bar. My bar and my employees are what keep me focused. I let nothing come between me and what I treasure. Until a small man with light and sass threatens everything I believe. When Kev comes into the picture, though... I realize sometimes addiction and obsession are one and the same. He works his way into the very fiber of my being, burrows in my soul. I'm starting to feel things I thought I had buried years ago coming back to the surface. I want him. But he's 21 years younger than me, and everything I'm not. Kevin. My plans are set. The moment I turn 18, I'm off to see anything outside this small NC town. I'd escape the sleepy closed mines and search for acceptance and love elsewhere. Funny thing about declaring plans. Sometimes the universe has other ideas. Despite myself, I find love, support, and even a family amid the small town community. Finding my forever family, I realized I can't leave. They're helping me grow and be the person I want to be. Growing my wings, I find Jax. Grumpy, no-nonsense silver fox bar owner. He is my opposite. Cold, brooding, and distant. But something about him draws me in. Unfortunately, he wants nothing to do with me because of my age. Or maybe because our courtship started with a lie. Once he finally lets his guard down and pulls his head out of his ass, we start to explore our relationship. Just as everything starts leading in the direction we both want, our fresh romance is turned on its head. Can I keep Jax beside me? Or are we bound to break apart? The Willow Wren and the Bear Once in summertime... The bear and the wolf were walking in the forest, and the bear heard a bird singing so beautifully that he said, Brother wolf, what bird is it that sings so well? That is the king of birds, said the wolf, before whom we must bow down. In reality, the bird was the willow wren. If that's the case, said the bear, I should very much like to see his royal palace. Come, take me thither. That is not done quite as you seem to think, said the wolf. You must wait until the queen comes. Soon afterwards, the queen arrived. 
with some food in her beak, and the Lord King came too, and they began to feed their young ones. The bear would have liked to go at once, but the wolf held him back by the sleeve and said, No, you must wait until the Lord and Lady Queen have gone away again. So they took stock of the hole where the nest lay and trotted away. The bear, however, could not rest until he had seen the royal palace, and when a short time had passed, went to it again. The king and queen had just flown out, so he peeped in and saw five or six young ones lying there. Is that the royal palace? cried the bear. It is a wretched palace, and you are not king's children. You are disreputable children. When the young wrens heard that, they were frightfully angry and screamed, No, that we are not! Our parents are honest people! Bear, you will have to pay for that! The bear and the wolf grew uneasy and turned back and went into their holes. The young willow wrens, however, continued to cry and scream, and when their parents again brought food, they said, We will not so much as touch one fly's leg! No, not if we were dying of hunger until you have settled whether you're respectable children or not! The bear has been here and has insulted us. Then the old king said, Be easy, he shall be punished. And he at once flew with the queen to the bear's cave and called in, Old growler, why have you insulted my children? You shall suffer for it. We will punish you by a bloody war. Thus war was announced to the bear, and all four-footed animals were summoned to take part in it, oxen, asses, cows, deer, and every other animal the earth contained. And the willow wren summoned everything which flew in the air. Not only birds, large and small, but midges and hornets, bees and flies had to come. When the time came for the war to begin, the willow wren sent out spies to discover who was the enemy's commander-in-chief. The gnat, who was the most crafty, flew into the forest where the enemy was assembled, and hid herself beneath a leaf of the tree where the password was to be announced. There stood the bear, and he called the fox before him and said, Fox, you are the most cunning of all animals. You shall be general and lead us. Good, said the fox. But what signal shall we agree upon? No one knew that, so the fox said, I have a fine long bushy tail which almost looks like a plume of red feathers. When I lift my tail up quite high, all is going well, and you must charge. But if I let it hang down, run away as fast as you can. When the gnat heard that, she flew away again and revealed everything, down to the minutest detail, to the willow wren. When day broke and the battle was to begin, all the four-footed animals came running up with such a noise that the earth trembled. The willow wren with his army also came flying through the air with such a humming and whirring and swarming that everyone was uneasy and afraid, and on both sides they advanced against each other. But the willow wren sent down the hornet, with orders to settle beneath the fox's tail and sting with all its might. When the fox felt the first sting, he started so that he lifted one leg from pain, but he bore it, and still kept his tail high in the air. At the second sting, he was forced to put it down for a moment. At the third, he could hold out no longer, screamed, and put his tail between his legs. When the animals saw that, they thought all was lost and began to flee, each into his hole, and the birds had won the battle. Then the king and queen flew home to their children and cried, "'Children, rejoice, eat and drink to your heart's content. We have won the battle.' But the young wren said, we will not eat yet. The bear must come to the nest and beg for pardon and say that we are honorable children before we will do that. Then the willow wren flew to the bear's hole and cried, Growler, you are to come to the nest to my children and beg their pardon or else every rib of your body shall be broken. So the bear crept thither in the greatest fear and begged their pardon. And now at last the young wrens were satisfied and sat down together and ate and drank and made merry till quite late into the night. Thank you for joining Freya's Fairy Tales. Be sure to come back next week for the conclusion of Laura's journey to holding her own fairy tale in her hands, and to hear another of her favorite fairy tales.